And then in terms of the enabling architectures, I think maybe the colleagues at CSR probably are more versed with some of these things. But what technologies do we need to enable all that? At the very high level, we collect the data, we store it, we analyze it, and we consume it. There's a frenzy of developments and, and, and software stacks to help us do these things. I submit these are some of the things that we should really be thinking about uh, teaching early on, uh, computer science courses, to make sure that uh, students keep abreast. And of course, at a very high level, people are now talking about this convergence of big data uh, and the high-end data analysis um, and HPC. There's a very nice conference every year called Supercomputing in the US uh, where, they, where they discuss some of these advances in exascale and how, we, how we're going to get there. I thought this diagram was also very nice. There's a report uh, by the BDEC that I would encourage you colleagues to look at. AI and machine learning. Um, I thought maybe given the theme has got something on that, I should put that in there as well to contextualize, nothing too academic. Um, but let's think about it. Is there a lot of hype around big data and machine learning and all these technologies? The Achilles heel is in the quality of the data. You can have all the technologies you want. If your data is rogue, is not clean, is untrustworthy, what do you infer? It could be that the bulk of the work should be to make sure that our repositories contain clean data that has been validated so that those decisions you make on top of it make sense. AI, um, people are talking about using artificial neural networks for pattern recognition. You give it a lot of training data and you give it examples and then you give it a lot of data and then it can tell you uh, some, some interesting things about your data. Proven work, very old work, uh, but it's becoming more increasingly uh, useful because of the compute that you have. Some very, very good success stories. I'm sure you heard about the, the image recognition pattern. There are systems now, you give it a cat, it will tell you that this is a cat. You give it a cat with one eye, it will tell you this is a cat with one eye. Very successful. Um, but they've got shortcomings. You take a panda, you give it some, an image of a panda, and you randomize some noise, you add it to the image, and it tells you it's a gibbon. Who's seen how a gibbon looks like? This is a gibbon. Can you see? So the hype. You must understand the limitations of technology, uh, both practically and theoretically. And you can bamboozle the AI eyes. Uh, there's a picture of a banana. The AI can recognize it as a banana on its own. You put a little bit of well-designed sticker next to it, it thinks it's a toaster. Yeah? It's been shown how to fool your AI with some of this. So if you religiously believe in these things, you have to understand the use cases where technology uh, makes sense. For me, really, as an academic, uh, I think the value or the interest is also on the research data and how we're doing science. And we all agree that we've transitioned from just being look at experimental in the old days, going theoretical. Could it be that we are going data intensive? Because the data is there. Before you had to generate data so they can do things, but now you have the data. People are now talking about uh, the software processes. You've got the data, all you've got to do is do your deep learning and come up with predictors, those recommender systems. This is critical. I've interacted with South African colleagues. I think you're on the right path. You're doing great things. You've got your Teresa. You've got your Sandren. You've got your CHPC. And these are good things. Uh, but in essence, we need these things to make sure that we accrue the best out of the research data. We need the data, uh, the research data infrastructure. Your sciences generating a lot of data. And of course, your data infrastructure that entails the compute, the storage, uh, the visualization, and the like not to mention the data science, which is where the skills are. There's also an emerging consensus when it comes to research data. Uh, fair data. Make sure that your data is findable. Don't hide your data out there in some PDF, um, in some file somewhere. Let it be findable. Let it be accessible. Let it be interoperable. And let it be reusable. The reproducibility of results 
depends on these things. If I'm a professor, I do some work, leave my data in my laptop, 10 years down the line, I want some student to look at the data. Where is it? Or if, God forbid, I leave the university or get run over by a car in Cape Town, my data is in my laptop. Where is it? This is public funded research. So all these things are very important for open science. We must make our research artifacts, research processes, research outputs available through some mechanism. These are good things. Why you should do it? It's good practice to make sure that we, we communicate our data. And research data, open data, has transformed so many areas. I stole this from Derisa. I think it was a very important slide. Look at the old way of approaching things. The data is mine. I can almost hug it. Um, my data is not fit. Uh, third one there is a fool uh, uh, thirsty in an ocean of water. We're drowning in water, but we are thirsty. Something's wrong, isn't it? And then, of course, the usual dichotomy. I'm sponsored, but I think it's all mine. And the taxpayer says, it's not yours. The taxpayer's money. What's the value of your research to community? So I was going to go through these things very quickly. I anticipate some younger audience, but there's a lot of benefits out of making sure that our research data is available because then we can do data innovations. I don't know about South Africa, but in our countries, government departments have got data, but it's very hard for people to innovate on top of it, let alone access it. Is the culture, is the lack of governance structures, is, 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 is lack of the technology, but the data is there. The data is there. I remember hearing a very nice innovation in the US some young some young young developers who left Google went on to collect I don't know 100 years of agricultural data about a piece of land I don't know how many kilometers but how many kilometers they collected data about what has been produced in that piece of land in terms of product in terms of produce in terms of yields and they came up with a model that could then for example provide farmers with a risk analysis model to say if you grow this crop apply this mass fertilize this much moisture, this is what you are likely to get. Very important stuff. Allow me to skip through all this. These are just examples. And I was going to talk about digital transformation very quickly. Give me 10, 15 minutes, I'll be done. And the fact that we need to think about the skills for the kids, the future skills. What is it that we can start telling them today uh, going forward? You know about the digital what what, it was called digital transformation, digitization, disruptive technologies, yes? And the disruptive technologies, point of sale. The taxi is gone. Uber is here. I don't know. Have you banned Uber? In the UK they have because it was bad for business for the taxi drivers. Not banned, but they make it difficult for them. You know? Other things. So 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 we have technologies that are disrupting. Uh, people are arguing, as with the 4IR. Manufacturing is going to be transformed. Transportation, retail, smart cities, energy. You're going to have solar panels on your houses and pushing power into the grid instead of investing in the INGA and the DRC for hydroelectric. You can actually have power on your rooftops and sell it to the grid. Um, somebody mentioned augmented reality. These are disruptive technologies. I want to say this. People argue that we must be encouraging our kids to become T-shaped professionals. You must be broad, but you must also have depth. Yeah? Yeah. So it could be. I mean, it's not me. It's some company that tends to, to talk about that thing. But it sounded, sounded reasonable to me. T-shaped professionals. The learning pyramid. Gone are the days where the, the lecturer has got the monopoly to knowledge. Kids can go to the MOOCs and do some of the course. They can ask you difficult because they've got the same content like you. The question is, what are the teaching methods you need to think about? So progressively, you need to think about uh, uh, techniques, pedagogy techniques, uh, that, that enhance, obviously, uh, cognition and, and retention. Let me skip all, through all these things. The crux of the matter is, what are we doing about all these things? So we thought uh, we need to, at a regional level, in recognition of all these problems, I to start thinking about uh, regional projects uh, to facilitate 
our participation, our collaboration in, in these areas. All these things obviously are anchored on our policy instruments. I don't know how colleagues, how many of you are familiar with some of the continental and regional uh, policy frameworks. There's the Agenda 2063 that talks of the Africa we want, yeah? which I thought was very, very instrumental. Uh, SADC has got the SADC Vision 2050. In it, we have so many instruments, including the very last one, Digital SADC 2027, with a protocol on STI, instrument that will encourage us to integrate regionally uh, through RSTI. In Botswana, like all other countries, we've got our own national policies. I'm sure South Africa has got a spectrum of, of policies. I think this is encouraging science. Our politicians, as much as they're talking the talk, uh, seem like they're actually thinking is very, very important. Rwanda is doing interesting things. They've actually accepted and admitted that they've copied our policies, but they've implemented them. But I think we should copy how they implemented them <laughs> and get going. Very important. There is our new man. In his inaugural speech, he talked about things like digitization, information-driven decision-making, which I thought was very, very nice. So really, I preempted this. We decided to come up with a project uh, to develop, or at least to make the makings of a cyber infrastructure. And the tenets of the cyber infrastructure really are research networks. You have Sunren, computational resources, you have CHPC, the data and the tools and the facilities, including repositories, to enable that sharing and to make sure that we make those efficient driven uh, data discoveries, the policies to enable us to establish and utilize the cyber infrastructure, the human capital development. You'll agree these are lofty heights, but the world was built by dreamers. But at least we are making a start. The impact of the CI is well known. For me, the last pit is very important. Citizen science allows citizens to partake in scientific discovery. Uh, the coagulation of data resources so that you can share them. Uh, examples of cyber infrastructures. Europeans have them. Americans have them. Very, very important. With us, we looked at, because you need to convince the politicians, where does the cyber infrastructure lie? And we drew this picture for them. I happen to be in the working group and chairing that working group. Very, very important to convince politicians that you're not just taking the money that they'll be using for hospital or something else. Tell them you're already doing these things, and this is how they align. And we also told them that this thing will help with the things you're trying to do. All these things require data. All these things require compute. All these things require infrastructure. Give me five minutes and I'm done. And there are some opportunities. Africa is catching up to the human genetics, genomics projects. Uh, we know the human se genome sequencing. Uh, drugs have been designed around the world that don't suit us because of genetic variety, isn't it? We should start thinking about uh, research in these areas that are focused on us because these are crude benefits going in the future. Food security, the SKA, um, investments in very expensive instruments and the like. The need for connectivity, Africa is connected, etc., etc. In terms of the hardware, we worked with partners around the world to train our young people, to create an ecosystem of centers of high performance computing in the SADC region, and then to find partners outside. It's very expensive stuff. You don't commission a HPC center overnight. So we worked with universities to get decommissioned hardware from other countries to start providing the makings of little centers, and then training people by providing them with, with, with skills. Modest, this is a computer science department at University of Botswana. Uh, we shipped a couple of these machines from the US from the small departmental budget. And we are getting students to create clusters. We are getting them to run little miniature projects in there. We are supporting some scientists that have been doing their compute on desktops underneath their desks. Now they can run these things on the cluster. We can have licenses 
that were very expensive that were campus licenses to run these things. So the gains are there. We've created the map. You can see there are centers around SADC uh, with these little machines. And there's a plan to upgrade some of these things. With the help of partners around the world, we've gotten some charity to go to the US for the past three years to attend supercomputing and have workshops. Um, we've been in 2015, 2016, 2017, which I thought was great. And we go to ICTP for the data science. And a lot of students across the world can attend some of these trainings. Without taking too long, uh, a chair, this is what I have for you. Uh, it's a project that recognizes that as a region, we need to develop policies that enable us to collaborate. We need to enable uh, an environment that can allow us to collaborate by providing infrastructure. We need to train our young people to have the relevant skills. More importantly, we need to subscribe, subscribe to what the politicians are talking about in terms of things like the static digital uh, industrial strategy. I could go on and on, but maybe I think in the interest of time, I'll stop there to give you that regional dimension. Thank you very much.